Origin stories, origin stories. Where did we come from? How did we get here? These are the stories that made us the heroes that we are today. Back to season two of Origin Stories after a year delay. We're back with more, and I'm really excited that uh, George is here with me. ICC Trombone is joining me, and um, I'm really excited to hear what your what your uh, your comics are. I know some of your story from being on the forums for so long, and uh, but I'm I'm curious because as we've discussed before, your tastes in comics are not quite the same as a lot of the other people on the forums. So I'm really Really curious uh, to to see what your picks are. Is that the word you're looking for? <laughs> <laughs> you have you have some tastes that uh, others don't share, um, but uh, that's that's what makes these interesting. So uh, why don't we just jump right in and uh, you can show us what your first pick is? Okay. Uh, well, let me just first uh, preface everything by saying I got into comic books for two reasons. One, because my older brother, he's three years older than me, he would started buying them. And he would bring them home and I would read them. You know, he was about 13 or so and I was about 10. But it could have been before that. But that's kind of when I remember starting to buy comic books around the age of 10. But I'm sure that at age eight, eight and nine, I was already reading them. And also, when I used to come home from school, I used to watch uh, The Adventures of Superman. With, with George Reeves. And, uh, you know, also they had the Batman uh, reruns, but I also, I think I caught the last season when it was in prime time. My parents used to watch it and, we, and, I, and I got into that too. So when the comic books came along, it was something that he first started doing and then I started looking at him. And it's interesting because I, I, I had, to, had to call my brother. I actually called him yesterday to kind of try to jog some of my memory about if, I rem if I'm remembering things correctly, because the, we, we didn't buy books firsthand at the beginning. We, we, there were a lot, of, a lot of places. See, I grew up in, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in New York. And uh, there was a lot of uh, like grocery stores slash candy stores, stationery stores slash whatever. And there, there's always, there, always in the back of the store, there will be like a, like, a, like a dark area where there's piles of comics, I mean, just piles. And it was all the, I mean, we're talking about 1971, 70. So we're talking about all the, all the, the Silver Age, Spider-Man, every, everything that's really pricey now, they were in those piles. My brother came back with runs of Spider-Man and runs of Avengers. And I'm talking about the 20s, you know, uh, uh, the, um, the Avengers, let's say in the 20s or 30s, uh, Spider-Man in the 50s. I mean, runs, you know, he, he told me yesterday he bought the entire New Gods in one shot. Right there, see, he was, he was just coming back with piles. He told me they were five cents each, five cents. I was like, you know, I, I, I mean, again, I was a kid who was just bringing them home and, and, and I was consuming them that way. But it, it wasn't until about age 10 that I actually started picking up my own and actually buying my own. And the first, very first book I remember buying and actually picking is with my grandmother. My grandmother was, we were walking somewhere in the Lower East Side where the Williamsburg Bridge was. Williamsburg Bridge is one of the three bridges that attaches Brooklyn to Manhattan. And uh, they had a famous area called Delancey Street. And, and uh, it's over there, they did a lot of shopping. But anyway, at the corner of Delancey, at where the Williamsburg come, comes off, they had a, a, a newsstand. So we were walking by and, you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm 10 or so. And I'm pestering my grandmother to buy me a comic book. And she's OK, OK, she's not like the the motherly smothering type, she's more like, you know, whatever. So I asked her to buy me a, a book and she said, okay, pick one. So I picked this one. Nice. But guess what? She said, no, you can't have that one. Get, get something cheaper. <laughs> see, see what I did there? So this is the actual book that I ended up getting. The very first Fantastic Four, very first book that I, that I picked out my use all the other books I have had my brother brought them home and I'm just reading them you know but this is the very first uh book I got and it happens to be the very last Jack Kirby book 
the, the, the last run of the hunt, he did 102 in a row and then he came back and did like 108. But this is the actual the last one in the run. And and again, I, I, I mean, I loved it. I, I ate this book up and I was a happy guy at that point. So that's number one. And um, again, that's 1971, I'm 10. And that, that in my, I guess my brother was shocked when I'm coming home with my own comic books because he, he, you know, he, he he shared his comic books, but they weren't really mine. You know, they were his. Right. So now I'm I'm on the on the road of collecting my own. So number two is my, my father was a great baseball player. I mean, there was rumor that he could have been actually he was good enough to play in the major leagues, but I mean I don't know if that's a tall tale, but he was really good good player. And and he used to be member of uh, of uh, they called it the Spanish leagues in Brooklyn, actually Red Hook Brooklyn. And at the time, this is again, this is the same year, 1971. My my father didn't drive, so we used to take the subway all the way to, to to Red Hook. We used to take the F train from the Lower East Side. It was maybe five stops, and then you, when you got off, there was this big elevated track, and you had to go down the escalators and go down. And at the bottom of the of 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 the, where the escalators were. It was like a store, you know, candy store. They sold newspapers, whatever. And again, we're, we're going to walk from, from that train stop about two miles, just walking till we get to the baseball fields, which happens to be like next to the waterfront in Red Hook, Brooklyn. So, I mean, I asked him if he could buy me something. And, I, and, and he said, yeah, yeah, take whatever, you know, because he knew, I mean, what am I going to do? Is this, we're not talking about, we're talking about like maybe it was a weekday. It wasn't a Saturday. It was something where it's like four o'clock, whatever, five o'clock, and we're going out there. And he, I mean, what am I going to do? I'm going to be bored. So he he ended up he just said, take a book, and I ended up getting this book. I love this book. I love this book. And I tell you, my father passed away last year, and I didn't have this book. And I actually went on eBay and I bought a copy. And because of the pandemic, it didn't get shipped right away. So I bought a second one and then they both came at like the same time. But this book, it, it, I mean, I always like Superman. He's, you know, again, he's a big bro a boy scout, but you know, there's something to be said about a guy who does something and he's not getting anything for it, you know? So yeah, this is a special kryptonite issue. It, it, it was weird to, to, to see all these, these iterations of kryptonite. It, it, the Silver Age is a great time. <laughs> But my favorite story, I think, of all of these is uh, is actually a Superboy story. I mean, this is a book that's all reprints, you know. I mean, right. they had their own run. And then, you know, this is actually before the, the famous Kryptonite No More storyline. But yeah, so anyway, they had these, this book, all the reprints. And the story with, with, with Superboy is that he, the, something happens where he's, they, people are finding him like laying on top of kryptonite, piles of kryptonite, and, and, it, and you know, it could kill him. So what, what, what people were saying, what are you doing? You're killing yourself. And he kept every he, everywhere he went, if there was kryptonite, there was like a meteor shot who would just lay on top of it. And he's almost to the point where he's dying. And his parents step in and they say, what are you doing? You're going you're gonna to die. You know, what, what is this all about? And he said, I can't tell you. And then I finally, at the end of, of the story, it, it turns out that he found out I don't know what means some kind of whatever that that there was going to be 10 crypto uh, 10 Kryptonian criminals that were going to be released in you know, like 10 years when he's an adult and he has no way to fight 10 people so he has to find a way to become immune to the kryptonite so he can so he can kill them with the kryptonite when they arrive now it's so goofy because the story is that he's he's only immune to those particular pieces of kryptonite, and he actually takes the I know, and he actually <laughs> takes those pieces of kryptonite and he puts them in a special place, and that's what I'm gonna use ten years from now when they arrive. I mean, of course, it's a throwaway story, and there's no way you could be immune to one thing, and, and I mean, every other piece of kryptonite could kill him, but these these bunch of bricks of kryptonite, I'm okay with these. I'm just gonna wait for that. So again. One of those eight page throwaway stories that, that I guess uh, were very popular down, down that time. Yeah, it's interesting. You had mentioned the, the, the timing of that all kryptonite issue coming out because it wasn't long after that that they did the kryptonite no more. And they just, it, it shows like the, 
I mean, they had a new editor that came on when Mort Weisinger left, and they just went from celebrating all the kryptonite stories to getting rid of kryptonite completely in just the space of like a year and a half. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, um, I'm really appreciating your stories, you know, with your with your first issue there. My brother never read comics. He was into baseball cards. And so we had a bit of like a sibling rivalry where he'd be collecting his baseball cards and he'd be telling me how stupid my comics were. And I'd be collecting my comics and I'd be telling him how dumb his baseball cards were. I eventually started collecting baseball cards myself, but he never, he never read comics. Um, he just thought the content was goofy. And I was like, but you're collecting a baseball card. You can't do anything with it. I can read a comic. And of course, nowadays people collect the comics and don't read them. So I guess, you know, the <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, you know, when I did my, one of the, one of my, the comics in my collection that I treasure the most is my copy of Gru number one, uh, the epic one, because that was something where my dad used to read comics when he was a teenager and when he was in Vietnam, he used to read comics. So when I started reading comics, I would show him my comics and he'd look through them sometimes, but the only one he really liked was Gru. Ah. So every time that I would get an issue of Gru, I'd read it and I'd give it to my dad. And so we did that for the, I bought the whole, all 10 years of the series. I bought all 120 issues when they came out. Um, and so you I don't you have you bought the Epic. Or did, you, or you, did you buy the Pacific ones? The Epic. So okay. I had just started reading comics when the Epic number one came out. I bought it off of a spinner rack at a drugstore. And um, so that I don't have the rest of the run, but I kept that number one. I still have the original. It's all beat to hell. Uh, and I've, But I've had it signed by Sergio Aragon as I had it signed by Stan Sakai. And uh, that's like, it's really important to me because it was something that I shared with my dad, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Cause you know, yeah. it's more than a comic book, it's, 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 it's the experience. My father, the only time I ever seen him read a comic book was he read Rawhide Kid. He liked the Westerns. He liked the Westerns. He was into John Wayne and all those Westerns back in the sixties. And the only thing I ever saw of me was, was Rawhide Kid. And he, he kind of enjoyed it too. But I mean, I, I don't know that we didn't really buy a lot of Westerns, so that wasn't something that was going to be kept going. We were going to keep going, you know. Yeah, my dad, I, he used to read Thor back in the '60s the, when the Kirby was doing it. So he would sometimes read. I was Walt Simonson was doing it when I was when I started buying it. So he would read that once in a while. But uh, the Gru was the only one that he really he really enjoyed. So I made sure we it kept getting that. Yeah, it was a fun book. I yeah. actually completed the run this year. I have the whole 120 issue run. And, and yeah. uh, one day I'll read them. <laughs> but yeah, you know, they're, they're fun books, you know? They and, are, they yeah, are. They did something, I don't think it was from the beginning, but they did something where they actually had a hidden message in every book. Yeah. You, you remember, I don't think they did mm -hmm. the whole series, but, and it's funny, my first wife used to, that's why I got actually got the Guru run, because my first wife loved Guru. And she loved looking at the find trying to find a hidden message. So I ended up buying all the I, I remember in the 90s I went into this comic shop and I I must have bought about 50 or 60 grooves. And the guy just looked at me like, What's wrong with you? I mean, he was selling it to me, but he was just look, he was shaking his head. He just couldn't believe that he could <laughs> unload all these grooves all at one time. But you know, then after that we called him Groove every time we saw him. But <laughs> yeah, it's funny how you get these collections, you know. Yeah. All right. So, what's your uh, third book? Yeah, that's okay. That's so much. Yeah, okay. The other one doesn't count. All right. <laughs> this, this, this book kind of introduced me and one and gave me the love for the Avengers that I have now. I have a pretty good collection of the Avengers. I only lack issue one and four. Of course, the most expensive books, but this is the book that kind of did it for me. And this is the greatest cover of all time. I, I'll fight anybody over that one. <laughs> this is a great cover. Now, yeah. now, this is when I was just learning about the Avengers or just learning about, uh, you know, the, the, the first five. And it was just, it was so special to me that the first five, the original five were fighting the, the you know, the newer version. And I didn't really know these characters, but 
there was a friend of mine that used to live, I mean, I lived in a project and there was a guy that lived on the fifth, uh, fourth floor and I lived on the fifth floor and he used to buy a lot of comic books and just give them to me. He was like, he was like a couple of years older than me also. And this is one of the books he gave me along with uh, the early reprint books, Marvel superheroes, they reprinted like Avengers 3, Avengers 2, th those books. But th I was kind of getting an education about the Avengers and I love the original, you know, the, the original, let's say 16 issues with Captain America and those people. So when, when I read a book that actually went back, they went back to a different dimension and they see the actual original guys, it just blew my mind. I mean, look, John Buscema with the, one of the greatest covers of all time. The inside was by Don Heck and uh, Warner Roth, if I remember correctly. And I just loved it. I loved this book and, and you know, Anytime I find this book, I'm buying it, you know, but there's just something There's also the, the book is important also, but there's another reason. And I, I kind of realized it afterwards. This might be the first book that introduces a parallel universe. I'm not sure they did that in Marvel before this. They actually went somewhere else and said, OK, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a historian. You have to call say you. Yeah, no, it's, it's, this might be one of the first ones. Yeah, I mean, they had done it in D.C. before that with the Earth-1 and Earth-2 and Justice League. But you might be right. I can't think of an instance before that where they went to an alternate, an alternate Earth. That's a great – it's not just a great cover. It's a great story and is part of – now, I'm, I'm a huge Avengers fan. As far as superhero books, Avengers is my favorite. I have a complete run, and I got lucky because, you know, my parents got me issue one for my birthday – uh, and then my dad bought me issue four. We were at one of the first back issues I ever got was Avengers four because we were at a store. I just wanted whatever the oldest thing they had was of Avengers. Oh. And they had an issue four is $12 wow. and um, 50 cents. It's really beat up. It was beat up. The spine was splitting and I was so worried that, that the cover was going to split that we got some rubber cement and, and rubber cemented the spine to the cover to make sure it wouldn't come off. And, it's the book so beat up that I don't think that actually affects the grade. It's like, it's that bad, but uh, those are really special books to me. And I only have them because of my, my, my father and my parents. Um, but for me, my favorite Avengers era is the Roy Thomas era. And specifically, I would say I would stack up Avengers. There's, there's a one year there if you look at Avengers like 51 to 60, it's the best year of superhero comics ever. It's got everything in it. You know, it's got the, the Black Panther joins the team. It's got the X-Men crossover. It's got the first Ultron and the Masters of Evil. And then it's got that storyline. And right after that annual is Avengers 57 is the next issue with the first appearance of Vision and then the origin of Vision and then the introduction of Yellow Jacket and the when every issue is an all-time classic it's the best superhero oh, the bomb. it's a it's just and the art's incredible um so it's just it's just the great and you know <laughs> that issue there might be a gold mine because now they're you know they're, now that they're doing all the stuff with kang in the movies who knows you might see scarlet centurion, scarlet centurion. uh show up there I love that book. And I actually, that might be one of my favorite two part stories because the story before that is number 56 that leads into the, the reason why they're even in another dimension is because Captain America wants to find out what happened to Bucky once and for all. Did he really die in the explosion? So he goes, they, the, he joins the rest of the Avengers in Dr. Doom's castle and they go in Dr. Doom's time machine to that era, to that day the, the actual day where they get on the drone plane and, and it explodes and it supposedly Bucky dies. Now, while they're there, the wasp falls asleep at the controls because she's controlling, they're bringing them there and bringing them back. And she falls asleep and hits uh, some kind of switch and they materialize actually at the time, at, at the actual place. Now, they fight the, the soldiers. And I mean, long story short, they find out that Bucky really did die in the explosion. Now, you know, Winter Soldier comes along about 40 years later and says, ah, that wasn't right. But you know, I still got that story. I don't care. No one's gonna come in my house and rip these comic books up. To me, they're more important than the Winter Soldier story. But that story, that tragic, sad story that leads into this epic fight 
It's just those are two issues. I think maybe the first best two issues the Avengers ever had, and that's saying a lot because they've had a lot of great, great stories. It's just like Roy, like that year, Roy Thomas. Everything he wrote was just the best, and the art was amazing. Yeah. I so. thought if Don had did that artwork and and the, at the beginning of the Avengers, my Avengers that I read were the Kooky Quartet and those 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 issues after Kirby left, like with issue six. And a lot of that was Don Heck. And to me, I mean he was my first love. So I'm I'm looking at the Don Heck stuff and I'm like, he's the Avengers artist. So I don't feel like they took a back step by having him do this annual. You know, so I, I I loved it. You know, the older I get, the more I like Don Heck's artwork. Uh, I don't love a lot of the later issues that he did, but I think that like for me, the printing quality and the coloring is weird in the in the like in the thirties. Um, a lot of them get very gray and muddy, and I, but it's not his fault. Um, I, he's he's underrated. He's he doesn't get the credit he deserves. And I'm going to say one last thing about this book, and, and I'm sorry if I'm going to set the, the forum on fire, CCF forum on fire, but Vince Caletta inked the book. <laughs> <It's> beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about, let's see what your next book is there, book number four. Okay, let me make sure I got the right one. You mentioned it earlier. You, you, uh, Neil Adams, when he came along the scene, he blew everything up. And everything, everything he did, I mean, he, he might be the most influential artist, maybe of all time, as far as how he changed, how people view comic books and how, I mean, a whole generation of artists want to draw like Neil Adams because they look so realistic. So, I mean, I followed him in the Avengers, Queen's for a War. I saw his Batman stuff, all of it was superb. And it was this issue though, that he, that he drew and Denny O'Neill wrote that, just blew my mind as far as going against conventional superhero stories. This is a reprint of Green Lantern, Green Arrow 85. 85, I think, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, at this point, any comic book fan is used to seeing covers that are not true. You know, you see something, oh, so, so and so dies, and you know, in a book, they don't die. So when we when I first got this book and I and I read it, I, I saw the cover, I said, yes, BD junkie, yeah, whatever. You know that's not true. So you read the book, and at the end, you come upon again, this is a reprint. This is the Baxter Baxter edition, because you know, I'll, I'm just a poor mailman. I can't afford uh, the actual book. But anyway, you see at the last the the last page, the last panel, Speedy shooting up a superhero shooting up in a comic book. I mean, that was major, you know? I mean, I've never seen anything like that. There's just, I mean, there was a comic code, the actual comic code did appear on that book. I don't know how they got it past them because it looks like he's actually using the drug. And I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I, it shook me, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. Again, th to that point, it was good against evil. The good guys always do the good things. The bad guys always do the bad things. It wasn't much gray. You could, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't until later on, maybe in the 80s and 90s, you begin to see a little nuance to, to the way characters are written. And good guys never did anything bad. And if they did, it was a mistake and oh no, it was a plan or whatever. Now, to, to see Speedy, like, I guess he's an anagram for Robin because he was, Green, Green Arrow that was Robin, you know, he was his psychic all these time, all this time. So to see him to a point where he has to take drugs, I mean, it was amazing. It was, and, and also, you know, Neil Adams and uh, I think Dick Giordano was on the artwork, you know, they, they totally delivered on that book. I mean, you know, it was, I, I couldn't believe it. And it, to, to that, I mean, to this day, that this, this is one of major books of maybe of all comics. It was a turning point, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, I did mention this before we started recording, but I just got my, I just bought issue 85 and I got it in the mail. It's sitting on the floor next to me, but it's still, I haven't, I haven't opened the package, so I can't show it. Um, yeah, it's, you know, uh, it's difficult for me 
as someone who was born in 73, I didn't start reading comics until 1984, to, I can imagine what the impact of these comics was at, on readers at the time, but I didn't experience it. So I, that's part of the reason I really like talking to you and the other people is to hear what it was like to actually see these comics because, you know, I can, I can read about what went into it and, you know, how important it was, but um, this is one where, you know, I can imagine just seeing it on the stands and like you say, just having my mind blown by what I was looking at. You gotta remember too, it was released, it was, it came, the, 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 the day it was on sale was uh, June, 1971, so I'm 10. And I mean, you know, at that point, you're hearing things about drugs, but I don't really know anything about drugs. I don't have I don't know anybody who's a drug addict. I was I was lucky enough that none of my none of my family members or anybody around me, you know, had that that problem. So to me, drugs were well, what's that, you know? So I mean, to see it in a comic book, I mean, I got an education that that you know I didn't know anything about. You know, I mean, of course they treated it kind of goofy the next issue because they had him go cold turkey and. All of a sudden, he's fine, you know, but just to, just the idea that somebody who who's supposed to stand for heroic ideals could to get to get, get to an into a depression and actually have to turn to drugs because he 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 uh he alludes to the fact that he had no he was being kind of ignored by by Ali Queen Green Arrow, and he had nowhere to go and he fell in with with with, with a, a bunch of guys that were. We're dealing it and we're also um, taking it. And it's just, you know, now he's taking it. You know, I mean, just again, that last page, I was like, boom, you know, they resolve it in the next issue again. But it does, it's something that, that actually uh, is part of Speedy's history. And they talk about it years later in the Teen Titans books and whatever. It's not like he's, he's still, he's recovering. He's not doing it anymore, but just it's part of what he has. They didn't recon it. They didn't say it didn't happen or anything like that. So, I mean, I, th th those Green Lantern, uh, uh, Green Arrow issues by O'Neill and Adams won awards and it was, they were highly acclaimed. Too bad it didn't sell, <laughs> the book got canceled. It's funny, Neil Adams, you know, he does a lot of books and even he can't say books are being canceled. Same thing happened when he was doing, uh, he and Roy Thomas did like the, the last run on, on uh, X-Men before it got canceled. So it's kind of like, you know, unless they were fibbing again, you know, you have a situation. Well, he claims that the, the book was doing really, it was doing so well that the distributors were stealing copies and selling them out the back of their truck. So they weren't being counted. And that's why it's because it sold so many copies on the black market that it destroyed the regular market. I, well, there are some conspir conspiracy theories about that, that also includes- He also says the earth is flat, so I can't, I have a hard time <laughs> taking him too seriously. You know what, they, they said the same, similar things about Jack Kirby's uh, Fourth World books. They said that those are selling too, and they just, they didn't have the data because it wasn't direct market. They, they, they had to rely on the, on the honesty of the newsstand people. And, you know, again, they did mention that also that people were selling them out of the back of the truck, so not ripping the tops off or whatever they did back then. But just, just you know, it was a powerhouse run. I, I, I have the Baxter collection. I have, I have uh, you, that's 85, I have 86. I actually have the conclusion that I picked up for like a quarter in, a, in the show years ago, I beat up one. It was in like, it might've been 50 cents. It was in, a, in one of those 50 cent boxes. All the books beat up, but I mean, I'm like, this is an actual copy, it's complete. You know, I'm I'm not so. I mean, I'm I'm a person that reads books. I don't I don't really look to slab them and put them in. in, in you know, wor worry about the condition. I want to be able to read every book I have. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So that that's number. What is that number four? Yeah. Let's talk about book five. I'm curious to see what you got here. Now again, the the, the thing about that that Neil Adams Green Arrow Green Lantern book is that it did something to violate the so-called rules of, of uh, superheroes. You know, they always did a good thing. You know, those tropes that, that you kind of sort of could count on at that point. So now along comes 1972. And I'm a, a, along with Avengers, I'm a pretty big Fantastic Four fan. I love the Fantastic Four actually. I like the, 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 
the, the, the uh, four of them are like a family and they fight. And of course, when you know, you, you have, uh, I started reading Fantastic Four when Jack Kirby kind of left and uh, I started reading some of the Romita books and I and when John Buscema took it over, that's the sweet spot for me. I kind of started reading it with uh, the Hope Fight 112. Then there's a, a run where he, they meet the Overmind and the famous book where Dr. Doom joins them to fight the Overmind. Those, the, all those books, really great books. And eventually Roy Thomas began to take over the, the writing. Now Roy Thomas was also writing the Avengers in 19... I want to get the dates right because you know I'm an old guy. I remember all this stuff offhand. 1972. Now there's a subplot in Avengers book where I mean there's an actual plot where they where they they are fighting the Sentinels, and at the conclusion of that is like a three part story. Great art by Rich Buckler, by the way. Pietro, who's a member of the, at the time. He disappears in the fight. Something happens. He, they, they, they beat the Sentinels, but in the in, in, in while there's like they're in a mountain and the mountain blows up and they can't find them. They don't know what happened to them. Right. Uh, again, this is what makes Marvel beautiful. You know, they, they say, okay, he, this happens there, but now you go to the Fantastic Four and this is this is where he appears next, and it's and they tie it into into something that's been happening with with the Human Torch and Crystal for many years. This is the book that's number five for me. This is the first time that I can remember that somebody's love interest kind of cheated on them. I mean, I don't know. Can you think of some before this point? I mean, she was the girlfriend. Right. You know, when you have a girlfriend, a Lois Lane, or who, you know, those, those types of, uh, uh, Mary Jane, they're not going to cheat on you with somebody else. And yet, you know, they, it, it, the, the, the running plot, subplot with the Fantastic Four is that she couldn't stay in, in a, outside of a tilling because the pollution was killing her. So she stayed with the, in a great refuge with Black Bolt and the rest of the Inhumans. Now, it turns out moments before that mountain blew up, she teleports in with Lockjaw and saves him saves uh, Petro. And while she takes him back to the, the, the great refuge, she's healing him and, and nursing him to health. And of course, they fall for each other. So now, this is the thing where the Human Torch was, he was like pining after this girl from issue one, maybe, I, I'm trying to remember was the time where she left the book. It might've been issue 102, 105, something like that. So, you know, we're, we're talking about from 105 to 131, maybe three years, where he's always wants to keep getting back with Crystal. And when he walks in, in the, in the Grey Refuge, and he finds her like stooped over. In fact, I'm going to have to show this, this page because it blew my mind. And, it, and it's funny because you the, the, the usual artist was either John Buscema and I think Rich Bucker might have been doing some books. But Ross Andrew did this book. He walks in and she stooped over him like that. Almost like, you know, they just finished doing the deed or something. I don't know. So like it blew my mind. And it blew my mind because that was his girlfriend. And she's not supposed to, she's supposed to be loyal to him. You know, they, they were apart all that time. And it always seemed like there was a circumstance that made them be, made them apart, not that she had she didn't want to be with him. And yet Pietro walks in and he's, you know. He's one of the jerks of the, of the Marvel Universe. And there you go. Now you got a love triangle. And at the conclusion of the story, which concludes the next issue, she chooses to stay with him, stay with Pietro, which I was like, huh? <laughs> you know, th that was the first time I've seen that. And, and, I, and, and just to make it a little more personal, I had such a crush on Crystal. <laughs> My whole, from the very first moment of that, I, I fell in love with that girl. And, and when he when she did that to the torch, it felt like she was betraying me as well. So I was like, "Oh man!" So that that's that is number five. It's interesting. Um, the sort of as a writer, it's interesting to me almost like the unintended consequences of Roy Thomas writing the story. 
and I, and I wonder where this was coming from. I know this is right around the time where Roy Thomas and his first wife got a divorce. So I don't know if that yeah, okay. played into it. But my introduction to Crystal was in the Vision and Scarlet Witch 12-issue limited series by Steve Englehart, where Crystal cheats on Quicksilver with some random guy. And so... You know... <laughs> <laughs> the character, this story basically changed how that character was written for like the rest of Marvel Comics. Uh, because other writers read this, they see this as part of her character. They see it as like a character flaw for her that she's, you know, not loyal and they write her doing this again in the future. And uh, I think it has a real, uh, I've, I've talked to other people that were big fans of Crystal from like the Kirby era and stuff. And there's a lot of old school readers who are very protective uh, uh, of Crystal. And as someone who started reading after she was being written this other way, I didn't like the character at all. I never liked her. And I, and it's hard for me to, to understand how people felt about the character before before this issue that you're talking about happened and changed the way everyone writes her and then looks at her. You know, she, she later on in an FF book, 150 gets married to P Pietro and it makes it seem like, uh, you know, he, that, that human torch accepts it and it's okay. And, but I mean, like you said, you know, these, these books, they, they go on years and years and years and all you need is another writer to come up and dredge up the past because there was another run and matter of fact, the Steve Edelgard had a, 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 a hand in, I'm trying to remember what issues they were. It might've been, might've been, uh, anyway, he takes over and the thing is like the leader and he recruits Crystal. And Crystal is trying to get it on with the Human Torch. At the time was married to, uh, uh, what's her name? The Scroll Lady. Yeah, they, they turn into the Scroll Lady. But she he was married to Alicia Masters at the time. Yeah. And she's actively coming on to him. So it's something that they just kept. You know, yeah. the idea that she didn't care. You know, she wants what she wants. And, uh, you know, that's a guy and I want the guy. And, you know, that's your problem. It reminds me very much in, in different circumstance. But we've talked, you know, at length before, of course, about Hank Pym because we did the Avengers, The Fall of Yellow Jacket. It's very similar to me. I started reading... The, uh, my introduction to Hank Pym was in West Coast Avengers 1, which was after. And so the idea that he has all these mental health issues and, you know, is a spousal abuser was just sort of like, that's just the way the character was for me. And I never knew the character before he had that sort of stuck on him forever. It's so funny you should mention that book, because guess what number six is? So... Book six is something that we've talked about at length, and I mean at length before. And it was in one of your podcasts, the um, Fallen Yellow Jacket podcast. Now, if this were a comic book, we have a little asterisk on the bottom, a footnote, and say, refer to, you know, and you go out there and get it, whatever. But this is the book. Infamous, famous and infamous at the same time. Now, again, a lot of the books, as if you're a comic book reader, for any length of time, you begin to see a pattern to the stories and you begin to guess what characters are, do, are, are gonna do. And, and after a while, books become like repetitive. This, the, most of the books on, on my list will deal with like, like something like breaking a wall or something, you know, just this book, it wasn't, you know, I mean, it's famous for being the slap heard around the world because he slaps a wasp and now he's a wife beater. But that's not why I, why I chose it. Why I chose it is that he kind of goes off the deep end. In, 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 in a nutshell, Yellow Jacket is called up on a court martial for an error he made in a previous battle the issue before. He's mentally unstable at the point and he, and he, uh, and he, comes up with a plan because he feels like he's going to get ejected from the Avengers. So he builds an adamantium robot to attack them so he could save the day and they can see how valuable he is. Now, while, when Wasp, Wasp finds out that he's going to do that, he slaps her. Okay, so now Jim Shooter, this whole big deal about whether he meant it or not, or whether it was a mistake or not. 
But point being, it changed this character forever. It doesn't matter what, in my opinion, I know they made some really good efforts. Uh, Kerbusiek tried, there was a run in a, Avengers Academy, where he's like the leader and he's kind of a teacher, and he he was there was good, but they some like you like you said in the podcast, some writer always comes back and refers to this point and makes a whole story about it. So, but this is a major and for another reason because, as I pointed out earlier in in, in this uh, program, I I was a big Avengers fan, I still am, and to me, uh, Hank Hank Pym, maybe was one of the important Avengers to me. Like not only was he with the first original five, but he kind of took over for the cookie cookie quartet after after they had their little run. And he stayed with the book for a really long time. And to me, he was he was integral to that book and he was he showed a lot of leadership qualities. And I also loved the marriage. I, I mean Wasp and him, I, I love that that love story. Now all of a sudden and all in one issue, he slaps her, he He's disgraced himself, and then the whole this starts off the whole like a whole year worth of stories where he's in jail and he has to fight for his freedom. So, but the point point being that the, the book it just this it it just it, it was something where I just I I just had to keep reading the book no matter what, and I didn't care who they were fighting, I didn't go who was drawing it, I didn't care what, anything, I just want to know what happened to my character, my Yellow Jack, my, my Hank Pym. So that, that's the first book of its kind that kept coming me back, kept getting me to come back every month just for that story, not for who they were fighting, just for what happened to my character. So that's, that's the book number one in, in, in the series of those kind of types of books. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, obviously we have talked a lot about this, and the, like everyone, everyone has strong opinions about this story if they've read it. Um, but I think it does a great job of just that of of getting you invested in the characters. As a as a big Avengers fan myself, it's definitely an inflection point where you where Hank Pym, even though he still continues to appear in Avengers for you know to this day the character does never had the importance not a sense then that he had before then and to me for the the experience that i had that i think is similar in some ways was in west coast avengers when they dismantled the vision and destroyed his personality and changed him into the white vision and all of a sudden he was just a robot Vision was like one of the anchor members of the Avengers for 20 years. He was a he was a major Marvel character, and the, when they did that, they destroyed the character, and he's never been nearly as important uh, you know, in the comics as he was before they did that. That really is an excellent comparison. I, 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 you know, for for your era, that's that's what happened. For my era, this is what happened. So you take a character who's solid and you're making them lesser than, and now he's, he never recovers. I, I, they did a lot of things with the vision. I'm not sure that he really recovered either. But I Yeah, mean, I don't yeah. think so. And it, and, it, and it got me very angry <laughs> because, I, because I love the vision. And, um, and yeah, it, it, uh, it's interesting. Like, there's some differences. Like, I think Jim Shooter just had his own take. He was trying to write a good story. Uh, John Byrne had his own agenda. He wasn't trying to write a good story. He's just he's just addled. Uh, I'm taking this off topic here a little bit, but I, I don't want to start ranting about John Byrne. <laughs> you know what I say about that though? From from what, from what I've been able to determine with writers and runs and and, and times times when when somebody comes on a book is that you're allowed to take the character, shake them up, do whatever you want, but you're supposed to put them back to where you found them. If you notice, a lot of runs that will store everybody at the end to pretty much what it was before they came along. I guess the illusion of change that Stanley referred to. Now, these are two examples where you broke the toys. You can't put them back anymore. They, yeah. they, no matter what you do, they're not the same toy anymore. There's a head missing or arm missing, whatever. So you can't, you know, you, you, you again, you, even, even Bendis, who you didn't like, when he took over the Avengers, he did a... I don't mean to trigger you, <laughs> but they, you know they, you didn't like him. But you know, if you read the concluding storylines of his Avengers run, he restored everything the way he found them. Even Hawkeye was alive. You know the people that he killed 
alive, and even a wasp who who in the storyline of uh, of uh, Secret Invasion gets like killed, he restores that too. So you know th that's really the the unwritten rule: do whatever you want, make sure you put them back the way they were. Now John Byrne didn't do that. You can argue that he kind of got fired off the book or he left the book before he could. But you know that's just that's what happens. But with Hank Hank Pym. It's been one horror after the other. So, I mean, he was one of my, he's still one of my favorite characters. I don't care. Like I said before, you can't come in my house and rip up my comic book. I still got them. And I'm still going to enjoy him when it was great. So. All right, let's look at book number seven. Let's, 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 let's try to move our, away from these dark times. And yeah, yeah. We let, let, let's, well, I, if you're looking for something lighter, <laughs> I'm going to have to disappoint you right here. <laughs> let, me, let me start by saying this Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel was introduced in 1968. Now, they didn't really know what to do with the character a lot. The book got canceled a bunch of times. It wasn't until Jim Starlin came along with issue 25, where he made him a cosmic, really transformed him into a cosmic being. He, he brought Thanos as a foil for him. And he, but even after when, when, when Starlin left the book, it, it survived for a while, but it was still struggling for the, for the most part. Now, we're talking about 1982. I'm reading in the in these comic journals and these comic fan magazines that they don't really know what to do with Captain Marvel. They've just never been able to kind of cement them. So they 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 hired Jim Stalin to kill him in the very first graphic novel. Now I'm like, graphic novel? What's that? Jim Stalin killing him? What are you talking about? So 1982, this was released. Very first graphic novel by uh, by uh, by Marvel. I think they tried it later on to claim they invented the graphic novel, but you know I think people in Europe have a problem with that 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 assertion. But anyway, the book is just excellent on many levels. But I tell you this again, going with the theme of of reading a story and expecting something and getting something else at the end. This is another book that fits fits that category. Captain Marvel contracts cancer, supposedly from issue 34, where he fights uh, Nitro, a, a, a villain that blows himself up. He blew himself up ne next to a canister of some things that contain carcinogens. And I think Marvel event, you know, eventually, you know, he gets cancer. Now, superheroes getting cancer or getting any kind of disease is unheard of. You never hear of anybody getting sick. And these guys are all superhero and vulnerable. They, you know, They'll reach for that canister up there on the second of shelf and take something and they're okay the next issue. So the idea that that somebody could die from something common that that every that that that's all around us. I mean, there isn't a person alive that doesn't know somebody who has cancer or died from cancer. So so this is something a sensitive issue. Now, from what I I heard I read, Jim Starr and his father died from cancer, and him writing this book was a way of like a catharsis and a way of him dealing with it, the grief about it. But even again, even to, I'm, I'm a guy that looks at the cover, I go, yeah, 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 sure. Let's see what happened to the book. So I read the book, he gets cancer. He, a, a lot of the Earth's heroes in, are enlisted to try to help him find a cure. And as the issue progresses, you're seeing him getting sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker, but yes, Reed Richards there, there's, there's T'Challa there. That's like the brains of the Marvel universe trying to see if they could cure cancer in like 10, 20 minutes. So, but what, even to the point of the last, let's say couple of pages of this book, I still thought they're not gonna kill him. They're gonna find something, you know, something else. They kill him. He dies of cancer. <laughs> A superhero dies of cancer. And I, 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 it just blew my mind. I was like, what? You know, I mean, it, 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 it's beautifully done at the end. You know, Jim Stallone always has to sneak Thanos into, into every story. But at the end, uh, uh, Captain Marvel, as he's hallucinating in the last moments of, of life, he imagines he's fighting Thanos, and Thanos welcomes him into the afterlife, which is again is amazing. The last page is, is they're all around his bedside, and you just hear the, the um, you hear a beeping sound, beep, you know that that rest, the part, the thing that uh, the machine that measures your heart rate, and. It's kind. Of, it's really kind of sad. You, you hear beep, and, and and I think mentor, the person that was in charge of uh, Titan, turns around and says he's gone, and that's how it ends. 
And it's just like, it, was, it blew my mind. A lot of people consider that book to be, I mean, again, there isn't a person alive that doesn't know somebody who has cancer or died from cancer. So this is something that, you know, it's just, it was a big uh, curveball. Now I object in, in this sense, I, I love Captain Marvel. I bought everything. I think I got the run from 25 all the way to it, the last issue 62 where, where uh, Doug Bonch and uh, Pat Broderick were doing the artwork. And I even bought the few Marvel Spotlight books that came afterwards. But I mean, you know, you can't be bad sales. And no matter how much you like something, if people aren't buying the book, you know, they're gonna cancel it. So this is their answer to, we don't know what to do with the character. And they, so they chose Jim Stalin, who was famous for killing people to kill him. Yeah, uh, so I have to admit, I haven't read this. I've read parts of it, I've seen parts of it. It's very famous, of course. Um, and it was really famous at the time. I, you know, I started reading comics in 84. So when I was getting into stuff and really getting into comics in 85 and 86, this was had just come out before that. So it was something everybody knew about it. Everybody knew like this was like such a such a big deal. Um, yeah. It is interesting how. How business decisions can lead to good art like this it can lead to really crappy decision stuff too of course but this is a case like you said they didn't know what to do with them they had canceled the title several times like in between like issues i don't know 17 and 24 it was canceled like three times and uh it was very shortly after this death the captain marvel graphic novel that they introduced the new captain marvel monica rambeau it was very quickly and um i'm sure that was they they needed to keep a captain marvel around to keep the trademark so it didn't go, so dc couldn't use it for shazam so they were they had to have a captain marvel so it's uh, you can just you can kind of if you look at all of that you can see the the corporate puppet masters going this character doesn't work, but we need to have a character with the trademark. But it results in like a really great, a really great story, um, despite the very sort of pragmatic, you know, spreadsheet origin of how they decided to do the story. You know, Scott, this kind of book, I'm, 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 uh, I'm kind of disappointed you never sat down and actually gave it a read, a respectful. Just I'm going to read this because this is something that's right up your alley. You like these human interest stories or romance. This book has no action at all in it. Nothing, no fighting, no nothing. Everything is, you know, the, the, yeah. the, and you're running against walls. Is and, and it's kind of similar to anybody who's known somebody with cancer or fighting cancer. They keep running into walls. They, 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 they say, okay, well, we're gonna do this. And, and then something else happens where they can't. There's a point where they say, well, uh, we, we could probably cure him, except that the nega bands that he's wearing are, are, are hurting the cure. It's like, it's not allowing whatever cure they had to, to work. So it's like, every time you think, well, yeah, they're gonna fix, they're gonna fix it now with this, something else happens. So, you know, it, it's like very frustrating in the same way that like somebody battling cancer, knowing, living with somebody who's battling cancer, that you feel like, Oh, he's going to get better, and then something else happens that he's not getting better. And it, again, it's, it's it's really, you know, it's it, there's no action. But I mean, at the end, the hallucinatory battle with Thanos, you could claim that's action because he kind they kind of fight it out, you know. And even that, it's it's kind of a genius move because it's Captain Marvel fighting and resisting until he go, gets to the point of acceptance. Like he's yeah. fighting, and that's his own you know, way of saying, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die, and then finally just saying, okay, you know. It's a comic that, like, I think I would appreciate now as an adult, and have, you know, my mother passed away from cancer, I would definitely have a different perspective now. It's not a book that I've ever owned. Um, it's possible that I did read, a friend of mine, I think, might have had it, but if I had, if I read his, it would have been in the mid-80s, 
uh, at a time when I was, you know, 14 or 15. So, cause I remember the story well enough to think, you know, I'm very familiar with what happens from plot level, but I know I would experience it very differently now um, as an adult than I, than I would have at the time. Well, this, um, is, this, this is actually my very, my copy for when I bought it. This is the first printing, the, actually the one I bought at the time in 1982. And I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a give you a geek, a little geek uh, Easter egg. If you turn the cover around, you'll see Superman back there. <laughs> <laughs> Superman's in the back, I think it's there. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. He's right behind Wolverine. You see the spit curl and then the bottom. Yeah. So Superman has to go everywhere. I'm sorry, that's just, that's just, that's the way it is. <laughs> well, I'll have to, I'll, you know, I should read that, even though it's Jim Starlin. Uh, I should read yeah, it anyway. You know, something, it, it, it's interesting for another reason, too. You know, Jim, Jim Shooter, again, he gets beat up a lot and bashed a lot, but he came up with something. He says, look, you know, do this story. And he's not taking any credit for it, but that was his idea to kill him. I mean, it, you know, again, Jim Starlin wrote it because he just went through losing his father. So he felt that that's a way of getting it out. And, you know, I guess everybody kind of gained from that, you know, but I, I still, I, I like the Captain Marvel character and I really don't like the ones that came afterwards. So, but, you know, that's business, right? All right, let's, let's, we can, uh, so that, you're right, that was not a, that was not a happy pick me up comic, but what do you have at number eight? Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm not sure if you can say this is going to make you happy, but this is something that, again, I'm not, I, I, as, a, as a, a young person or as an adult, I've never really been into horror books. I don't get scared by movies. I just, it's just something I want to go, oh yeah, okay, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe reading anything could, could actually affect me in a way of making me scared or, you know, just giving me that, that jump, that, 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 you know, so, just kind of, it's, just, it's a comic. You know, ultimately, I'm just going to go, oh, I could pull back and step back. It's just a comic book. Well, along comes, along, along, along comes a man called Alan Moore. And he starts to write something called Swamp Thing. And before, Swamp Thing, it was a decent book even before he took it over. But he, it, it, issue number 37, which is my number eight pick, he introduces John Constantine. But that's not the part of the book. That, that that made me sit up and take notice of Alan Moore and the power of writing and the power of, of what you can see on a page. At this point, this is that March 1985. It's a year away from him doing Watchmen, but this is really where he made his, his legend, doing this book. Now, uh, uh, there's, there's a storyline where John Constantine introduces himself. This is the first time he's apparently a guy that uh, that gets people together to fight supernatural threats in the world. He has to use and manipulate. So he's one of those guys that manipulate <laughs> uh, other people. He has to manipulate a swamp thing so he could realize the potential and find out what he could really do. Because before this, he's just a, a swamp creature walking around. He doesn't really, he has to tap the potential of all he could do and what he actually is. So he puts him on a journey to walk through America and find out all the evil. But in this issue where they introduce uh, Constantine, they show some of his other uh, allies from around the world. And they're all, they're all different walks of life. And, and they, he, he talks, anyway, he talks, to, um, he talks to Swamp Thing and he tells him, you know, I'll, I'll contact you later. He goes to New York. Now he goes to New York, he's sleeping. In something like a girlfriend's uh, or some female friend's uh, house, and the female friend is drawing something like an easel, like a big board, and just drawing. Now I'm watching this, and she's drawing just random shapes. And then, you know, as the book, as, as the pages pass, you see the shapes take more place. And then, and this is a funny image, but she's talking to him back and forth, and then, then she leaves or whatever. There's a there's a sequence where she goes to get coffee. And when she comes back to the easel, there's nothing on it, it's blank. Now, this is, this is where I'm like, what's going on here? 
she walks over and and the way the way i mean maybe i i gotta show it to you because this thing made me jump out of my seat it's a comic book <laughs> it made me jump out of my seat she walks away from the easel there's nothing there and as she she sees that she sees that her closet is a little ajar so she walks up to the closet and she sees this figure in the closet this is the this is the image that she was drawing on that page It's no longer on the page is in the closet and it chases her through the her apartment till she takes a swan dive through a window and dies now i'm like just just the image of that thing you open the closet and you see that thing with his head backwards and his arm like sold to the back of his body it was chilling man i was like whoa what is this you know i i just it blew my mind i was i, I was kind of scared for a while there you know and it's just a comic book as they say but that just showed you the power of the way the book was presented the way it was written the way it was drawn and i dare say that this swamp thing run with with the john totalbin art it, it might it might be one of the it's like a like a chris claremont john byrne you know frank miller klaus johnson in that level and and i mean this thing it blew my mind and, and as an aside a little a side note i don't think i don't know if you remember this but you gave me this book i do remember that yeah yeah, I remember I, I, on a forum I said I had to. Re, I, I sold my Swamp Thing run and I was trying to get it back, but I didn't really want to pay big bucks for it. And you were kind enough to say, you know what, I got a book. I don't give a crap about it. I'll send it to you for nothing. And I was like, wow, that's a really nice thing to do. You don't know me at all, you know. So I got this book because of you, but I but I had owned it before, and I have I have the whole Alamore run. It's just genius. It's just genius. This is before anybody really knew him. I mean, he really became, he really blew up with Watchmen. But this is, at this point, it was like he was doing things that were just blowing your mind and you just, you didn't even know what to expect next. But just the writing and the art, the way the book was laid out, the anticipation of these scenes, it just, you know, that's something that I, I didn't read in comic books. Again, most of my list are, are things that depart from your regular storytelling and your regular dopey story where you could guess the ending. I mean, that's really the magic of any medium, any movie, any show where you can't tell what's going to happen next. You just go, wow, where'd that come from? You know, and this is one of those books. People on my before, YouTube channel not, are aware. I'm not an Alan Moore fan, I, I guess. Um, I respect Alan Moore. I'm not really a fan, but people on my YouTube channel are aware that um, I strongly dislike Swamp Monsters. I just don't like any of them. Swamp Thing, Man Thing, Heap, all of these these muck encrusted monstrosities. Um, I, I actually read some of the Alan Moore Swamp Thing run when they came out. I don't remember which issues, but because I started reading in 84. So it was like some of the first comics I read somewhere in there were mm -hmm. some of the were at least one or two of those Swamp Thing issues. Uh, and I'm sure they went way over my head when I was, you know, 11 years old. It's possible. I guess in 86, I was 30, uh, I was 35. So, you know, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm reading since I'm 10. So we're talking about 20 something years of reading. So I kind of thought I saw it all. Yeah. So when I'm reading this book, I'm like, what's this? You know, again, <laughs> it was chilling. I'm not sure if I slept that night, but <laughs> it was kind of chilling. Um, all right, well, let's let's talk. Let's move on to your number nine book. I'm afraid I don't have a lot to say there. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, you, you, you missed that. You missed the uh, Alan Moore boat. Shame on you. Anyway, uh, I've read a lot of Alan Moore. It's just uh, you know some of it I like. I like top ten. I like Promethea to a degree. You yeah. know some of his stuff I like. I appreciate a lot of his stuff, but don't. A lot of it for me doesn't the word appreciate you appreciate so intellectually I appreciate his work emotionally a lot of it kind of leaves me a little bit cold it doesn't really connect with me the way that I would like and the way it seems to for other people so um yeah I don't know <laughs> okay we're coming down to the home stretch number nine is is a character that um, has been around he's a legacy character 
He started he started in a flash book. He joined the Teen Titans as Kid Flash. And you know, it, it was a funny thing because in, in, in 1986, when the crisis are infinite earths, which I think you don't you don't not a fan of that either. But pretty much what happens is it blows everything up, combines all the earths, and 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 one of the um consequences of the uh, of the conflict is that the Barry Allen version of Flash dies. Now, at the same time, Kid Flash was going through his own problems where he was losing his powers and something was happening with his body. But at the end of, of the Trice of Infinite Earths, he gains his powers back, but he's not all powerful like the other Flash was or the other or, or, or the other speed through it. That he could only top out at like 700 miles an hour. He couldn't run around the earth and, you know, which to me, you get an interesting, more interesting story when you depower somebody. Because to me, there's a problem with a Flash character that he sees everybody like statues. How do you beat a guy if everybody's just a statue? You know, so they took a power away from him. What I like about this book, this is number nine, Flash number one. Written by Mike Barron and uh, Jackson Jites did the first handful of issues. I think maybe the first 10. What I love about this book is that in the very first opening page, he turns 20. So he's no longer a teen Titan. And, and, and the way Mike Barron writes the book, he makes him into a young adult, along with all the mistakes that a young adult's gonna make. But what I love about this story again is that it's again, he's not, he's not a goody two shoes. And this, the, the, what, what happens, he, he's, the, the birthday, start, birthday party with the Teen Titans, he gets called away for some emergency in a hospital. He goes there, they tell him we need a transplant for a famous science fiction writer, but he's, he's all the way across the country. Could you do us a favor, run over there, get a heart, the heart that she needs and bring it back. And he says, yes. And they says, but what are you gonna do for me? And I'm like, <laughs> and, and they, they, they're like looking at him like, what are you talking about? He says, look, I already said yes, but this is not free. Everybody gets paid here. You know, she's getting a heart transplant. The doctor's getting paid. I want free medical health insurance from your hospital. And I'm like, wow, you know, an actual hero, an actual superhero saying, look, I got to get taken care of too. Instead of just doing everything for free. I like that. That was a nice element. He runs across the country. As he's running across the country, again, he has to stop because he's not, he can't get there in two seconds to come back. Plus, there's, a, there's something that Mike Barron added, which I really loved, and I wish they kept it. He has to eat um, an incredible amount of calories to keep the energy up, like you and I would. You know, if you don't eat en the enough calories during the day, you're going to feel tired or whatever. So you imagine a guy. That, that, that moves a hundred times faster than you, he's going to have to replenish a lot of calories. Uh, he's going to have to continually eat to just keep that energy up. So he's running across the, the country. And as he's running, the way, the, the way Mike Barron writes it, he says he runs another uh, like seven, seven miles or so before he realizes he saw somebody getting murdered. <laughs> he ran so fast, he saw somebody getting murdered. He goes back, it's Vandal Savage, which is a, the best depiction of Vandal Savage I ever saw in a comic book. He be, kind of becomes his uh, his his main adversary in in the run, but the, the whole point of it is that you're seeing limitations to a character. You're seeing uh, uh, challenges that I appreciate uh, the way he's being written. He's not a perfect person because in the, in the later issues he starts fooling around with married women. You know, he's still, he's doing things that anybody would do if you're young and you're stupid, <laughs> which he probably he pretty much is. And they do a lot of things, and it just that at the end, after he gets the the, the, the transplant heart to uh, to the to the uh, patient, he takes a plane ride, and as he's as he's there, there's somebody somebody tries to uh, hijack the plane, and I love the way they wrote it. They said that he's he's sitting in a seat, and he jumps out of the seat, and hits the guy like 80 times <laughs> with super speed, so bad that the ring he's wearing these marks all over the guy's face. And then he just back into his seat, like all in three seconds. So nobody really knows what happened. They seem blurs. So he's, he's sitting in a, in a plane and it's like, he says that he hit the guy so hard that he broke his hand. 
Well, I, 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 you know, that I didn't see in the in the Barry Allen flash. I never saw it in the speed super speed depicted that way before, and it just intrigued me that they had a whole different set of rules for super speed. I, I liked it. Plus, the character again, he's kind of a like a jerk. So it, it, it's interesting to see all the mistakes he makes during the run. Uh, Mike Barron only stayed for the first fourteen issues or so. He claims he ran out of ideas, but. You know, I, I like the run and it was, you know, I have I have to complete, I just completed getting all the 247 issues a couple of weeks ago. So I, I, I'm one of, the, one of these days I'm gonna sit down when I have enough time and start to read it one by one. But this book introduced it all because it was like, everything changed just like that. The minute he became, uh, became a 20 year old instead of a, uh, in, in the teens, now he has different responsibilities as an adult. And it's much more interesting in this one issue than Barry Allen ever was in his entire history. <laughs> well, I can't disagree with there. So I, I wish I could remember exactly the circumstances, but I definitely bought that issue, Flash One. We were on a trip somewhere and I got that and some issue Alpha Flight at a uh, like a drug, like a convenience store at a gas station or something. And, and I remember reading that and um, I had read a few of the last like issues of the Barry Allen run. And as you say, the rules for Wally are completely different And they've made, they've added so much stuff to him. That's completely the opposite of Barry Allen. You know, he, he's not this bland goody two shoes. He's kind of a jerk. He, at, you know, Barry Allen had in, like unlimited power, um, ridiculous, you know, he could run so fast he could time travel and he could walk through walls and do basically anything. And uh, Wally can't do any of that stuff. And um, he's, you know, he's broke at the beginning. He's broke and he, you know, he's he's a complicated character. I stopped reading with issue 18, which is right around the time that Baron left, but also, um, you know, at that point I was 16 years old, maybe. So Wally was a few years older than me and um, he really, I didn't like him. I, he, he seemed like an a-hole and I didn't want to read about him anymore because I was like, like, uh, you know, at being a 16, I knew people his age that were jerks in my real life. I didn't want to read about them in comics too. So, um, but, but I remember reading that issue and thinking it was like, his run is very interesting. It feels very different from any of the flash stuff before, for sure. I mean, again, it's, it's another comic book of, of the ones that I like that you don't know what's going to happen. I, I, he's supposed to be a good guy, but he's doing things that are not nice. He's playing, he started fooling around with a married woman I mean, she's estranged from the husband, but still, you're getting involved with something, you know. And he also has a girlfriend when the book starts. Uh, so Francis Kane, like a supporting character from the Teen Titans run, he's kind of seeing her, so so he kind of ditches her to go with this woman. And he's, I mean, again, he's not a terrible guy. It's just that he's he he follows his hormones, which again, at that age, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, everybody would, you know. So. It, 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 uh, well, I like the book again because you didn't know what was going to happen. You couldn't yeah. be sure that he wasn't going to mess around with that woman, or he wasn't going to. I mean, and I, I kind of it, it's a stupid thing too, but I kind of like the idea that he has to eat like eighty hamburgers, just 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 to not faint or whatever. Yeah. So, you it, definitely it, never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Particularly, like my memory is that right around the time he left was also during the millennium crossover where Wally's dad suddenly turned out to be a manhunter. And I was just like, yeah, what? look, I mean, we went through a couple of different characters. And of course, now you're throwing in, um, you're including uh, crossovers that the writer had no interest in doing. So they just have to involve everything. I mean, didn't Lana Lang become a manhunter also? I mean, I don't know that that crossover was terrible. It was a bad idea. You know, so now you have to include a story in that has nothing to do with what your plan is. You know, but but you know, yeah, I I, I like the character, and you know, I they went through a lot of runs. Unfortunately, as the book goes on, they turn him into Barry Allen. He's like all powerful. He can run through a speed force, and he can do everything else. But 
I mean, again, I guess it's up to the, it's a writer's job to uh, bring a challenge equal to the power set. I mean, you know, you have Superman, but you have to find somebody that can match Superman. That's what makes the story. You can make them up. You, you write it. You, you invent it, you know. That's why you invent Terra Man. Um, <laughs> Terrible Man. <laughs> I like Terra Man, but that's a different conversation. Okay, so let's go number 10. I'm curious to see it. what your last book is here. This, this, I think this, I know what it is, but let's see if I'm right. I don't think you know what it is. Uh, number 10, uh, again, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to preface it by saying this. Uh, I started when I was 10, and when I, around when I was 15, I kind of stopped reading comic books with the same interest because guess what? I discovered girls. So you become, you go through periods in your life where you, you ask yourself, do you read any comic books? You know, I don't really feel like buying anymore. I mean, it's not that it's bad or anything. It's just, you're changing. So you're, you're saying, telling yourself, you know, maybe I use the money for something else or whatever, you know, and, and that's happened a couple of times. I remember missing, a lot of the Avengers run around when Engelhaus started. I mean, we started with the Mantis books and then, but there was came a point there where I stopped buying the book. And I, it wasn't because I hated it, just because there were other more interesting things to do. So again, you go through a lot of periods in your life where, where you don't feel so uh, excited about comic books. And I, it, it, during the, this, the time of this, when this issue came out, I was also feeling that, but, who can't get interested in the idea that they're going to kill Superman? Oh, this is not what I was expecting. Not what you were expecting. No. I'm sorry. I was reading. I, I wasn't reading Superman. I might have been buying a handful of books. This is 1992. I, I just, I, I heard they're going to kill Superman. I just said, no, nah, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. Let me see. And this is one of these first books that I actually speculated on. I bought six of these. I went to my local comic store. I told the guy, could you, could you put six aside for me? I gave him the money ahead of time. And that ensured, at least it, for me, that he was going to actually give them to me. Because I heard a lot of horror stories about people wanting this book and putting it to be held aside. And all of a sudden, it went missing, you know, when it became this big deal. When he, when he got killed, everybody that was not a comic book fan was walking into comic stores and wanting this book. So I ended up buying six of these. And, you know, I sold them later on for chump change, like $6 each, but it was something to me. But anyway, it, it was major because, I mean, I'm going to tell you another thing that's kind of, I don't know if you'll believe this or not, but I didn't really, I wasn't really sure they were going to bring him back. I kind of bought the hype that he, they were going to kill Superman and that's it. So when, when they killed him, I was like, wow, they killed Superman. And I, I really thought that was it. And, and then it finds out that there was a plan all along and uh, they just suckered me again. But I think the, the actual, the, I think they did it well. They brought a, the Doomsday character, which was sort of like a, you know, I, I like what they did with Doomsday, how they depicted him and what later on they show what he was. Uh, uh, pretty much a person engineered that when you kill him, you can't kill him the same way. He's adapting to everything you do to him. So he, he, he he and Superman killed each other and the famous black bag issue, which came with, yeah, I still got the stuff. Came with stickers, right? It came with a black armband <laughs> that you're supposed to wear. I still got the black armband. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you ever bust that out and wear the black armband around? <laughs> and then there's those, I think there's posters and things like that because they made a big deal out of I don't want to break the poster, you know, break, kill the value. But yeah, a funeral for a friend or whatever. So I guess they had the whole thing planned out ahead of time that they were going to do. But it, even after they killed them, the storyline was pretty interesting because, you know, you, you learn later on there's four people appearing around like Superman and people think one of them is him resurrected. So it, they did a lot of good things with that story. But it's it's a, it's a book it's a book that got me back in the game, because at that point I said, like, "Wow, Superman!" It, it was exciting, and then I started to discover those other books, Image Books, and those other companies coming out. So it kind of revived my love for comic books, and that's when I started buying like everything in the '90s. Every company that came out, I bought them all. 
I bought Tops, I bought Malibu, I bought Image, I bought I, I, every book, that, every company that came out with something, Dark Horse, I bought all the whole entire superhero lines. So I guess I had a lot of disposable income back then. But <laughs> it was an exciting time to be a fan. And I guess it, also everybody thought they were a dealer all of a sudden. They all thought they were going to make a million dollars. But it kind of got me back in the game. And ever since then, I've kind of stayed. You know, I, I, I love comic books. That's my hobby. That's my passion. And that's kind of my story. Yeah, it's interesting because I totally agree. There's there's times where I've sort of gotten, I've never fully gotten out of comics, but there's times where I wasn't collecting. I was just reading. Um, there was a period where like my collection was in storage. And so I'd buy the new issues and then I'd just throw them in the closet. And, uh, you know, I would like, wasn't really a collector and I wasn't, I was just reading for fun. And there's other times where, you know, for me, my interest in, in one genre or another, like I don't really read superhero, new superhero comics anymore. I've moved on to like different types of things and I've found, you know, I just, I just spent yesterday reading 10 issues of Barbie fashion. So you're always looking for some new exciting thing to spark your interest in, in comics. Um, and, uh, you know, it ebbs and flows for me. It also ebbs and flows. Some of it has to do with what's going on in my life. Some of it has to do with what's going on in comics. Um, you know, I, I gave up on Marvel during the, the dark rain um, is, is starting with Avengers disassembled, but then really with civil war, I just, realized that what they were they weren't writing for me anymore um they, and they some, just some good things came out after that too when they when the Avenge, when they came out with the ultimates the brian hitch uh frank millar that, that was, those are fun those are good books those i, I good won't books. i won't read anything by mark millar what you're saying is correct if, yeah. if somebody is giving you stories that are all the same and there's nothing new then you go someplace else where you can find something that that can stimulate your interest again. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, most of the books on my list did that. They, you know, they, right. they, they, they kind of revived me as I was going, as my interest was waning. I said, oh, I never read this before, you know, something else. And I guess you do the same with, you know, with, 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 uh, with your interest because, you know, if you don't, superheroes don't do it for you anymore, then a nice romance book will, or, you know, a nice Archie book will, something, something else, something different. Yeah, I know you're not a big fan of the Archie stuff, but I'll tell you this. They're a lot better than Barbie. <laughs> now that I've read a bunch of the Barbie I stuff. I couldn't guess that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Archie comics are superior to Barbie. Um, but, uh, well, thanks very much for sharing. Do you have any, any uh, final thoughts? I really, I, I, I appreciate your selections. Uh, the, you know, just sort of the focus on the issues that sort of, changed changed how you think about comics and uh, sort of broke the rules that i tried to co uh, concentrate again there's just many comic books that i just well, i think were amazing but that the ones i picked kind of either kept me going or change like you said it, it, it introduced something that i never saw before you know i'm sorry i loved crystal and when she cheated on, on the torch i was like oh. you know yet I have to buy the next issue to find out what happens, you know, and that's how they get you, you know, like the soap opera aspect, they keep pulling you back in. By the way, what was it, what, which book did you think was going to be number 10? I thought it was going to be Savage Dragon, number one. I toy with the idea of that, except that although it's great, it's, it's the strength of that book is that it's unpredictable. That, that I like. You don't really know what's going to happen. They kill anybody at any time. So that that I like, kind of uh, uh, kind of reminds me of you ever seen the Pulp Fiction the movie? Yeah, that movie is great. You don't even know what's going to happen from one second to the next, you know. So that and, and you if you watch enough movies again, you can guess what's going to happen. You know, oh, this person's going to die. That person's going to do this. But books that keep you guessing, you know, those are the best. They're, they're the ones that that keep your interest. Origins, origins, it's where we come from, it's where we've been, everyone's got one.